Uh, most of people, most of people today, old and young, do not hold Christian view anymore. Because there is this strong society's anti-God rhetoric, rhetoric and uh, cheap slogans that demean anyone who would oppose the view of long ages for life existence and of uh, creationism like we Christians believe. Why do we do this? I believe it's because they simply have not been taught the foundational truth of the Genesis. And this is why we, in this four-part series, have been exploring some really basic topics. And uh, we will announce soon, we will study them on Wednesday evening, some more of those topics together. So how do people deal with this society's anti-God rhetoric? They either departmentalize their life and have their private faith life and their public work a life, uh, kind of life where they don't actually talk about their faith. They become very insecure about talking about their faith, or they compromise their faith, and everything goes as long as it's accepted by the majority of, this, of the society, and then they keep a little bit of faith, like, you know, Jesus' story, and so on and so on. We're going back to school very soon. And uh, this is probably what, back to high, to, sorry, the university to some, of, to some of you. And when I was a kid, this is what it kind of looked like to me. I was going to the public school where evolution, uh, which of course wants to destroy the old background of the origin in the Bible, is working against, was taught to me every single day. And then if your child is like this, and then you go even to watch on television on any of these days, especially on the free day, you will again be taught evolution, evolution is true, uh, this is, this is uh, real, this is uh, scientific and so on. What you will be told in the church then are stories. And what, is gonna ex what do you expect is going to happen to you when you hear from everyone who is intelligent saying, hey, you know, the evolution is true, these are the facts, and then you come to church and then you hear a story. What will you think it's reality? I don't think you will have a chance to really be an intelligent person and a person of faith. That's why it's really important that we engage ourselves in some real thinking and a real science and distinguish between science and science fiction. Science produces mobile phones, science fiction produces theories that are really just made there to oppose the view that God created us. Now, I'm going to help you some a little bit today. There is a magazine, and there, I think I have a 30 of them. They're called Creation Magazines. And if you would like to get into the reading a little bit and thinking process of how, why are there, and find out why are there many, many scientists who are Christians and who believe in six-day creation, uh, you should start reading one, some of those things and get more of the... Uh, uh, material to really engage your brain in this matter. So I'm going to leave those magazines here. Perhaps take them at the back. Please feel free to take one of them home. Uh, the best thing is to subscribe to it and to read material. Okay. St Stephen Jay Gold said that human life is the result of a glorious evolutionary accident. He believed that uh, evolution, of course, happened, has created everything from the big universe to the stars, to the planets, to the matter, and to the life itself, to the complexity of life that we today see and which has Karina showed us on the screen in the children's story. Is this possibility? Of course, many scientists are going away from this, this view because complexity of life is just such a big, so much, life is so complex that they cannot see that it will be possible to create complex life through a unguided processes that just are without any uh, mind behind it. And these people are not just Christian scientists. There are many non-Christians who don't necessarily believe in God but who are accrediting a lot of what they learn to a super intelligence, to a designer behind persons. Today, I wanted to present you just three fields uh, of science that are talking about 
why many scientists and non-Christian scientists are seeing that there is a designer behind what we have in the nature. Three of those fields are astronomy, molecular biology, and paleontology. And I think I'm only, only cover one of them and let you some reading for home, uh, asking you to look at them. Who is this? Sorry, who is this? Are you sure it's Mr. Bean? How do you know? Say again. How do you know this is Mr. Bean? Say it. How do you know this is Mr. Bean? Please, can somebody tell me how do you know this is Mr. Bean? Sorry? His facial expressions show it. What else? How else do you know it's Mr. Bean? His suit, his outfit. What else? His smile, his eyes, his tie. There are so many things that looks like Mr. Bean. Why did person not believe this is Mr. Bean? This is Rowan, Rowan Atkinson. One reason simple, because he has decided in his mind it's not. It can't be. You don't see very often uh, actors go around, especially in this shop. If a person looks like Mr. Bean, talks like Mr. Bean, claims to be Mr. Bean, could it be that this is Mr. Bean? And in the same vein, I'm asking a question today. If the world looks designed, behaves designed, and there is, a, there, there is an author claiming to be designing this world, could it be that this world indeed was designed? Richard Dawkins can't help himself. He constantly talks about how things have appearance of being designed. Of course, they're not designed, he continues, because it can't be. Then you have to believe in this God thing. But there are many different uh, uh, statements by him and by other biologists, by other scientists who don't believe in God, who simply cannot help themselves but point out this is appearance of design. Richard Dawkins says this in an Expelled movie by Ben Stein. I don't know if you've seen this movie, Expelled, that talks about how the scientists who do believe in God are very often kicked out of work simply because they have... They do great scientific work, but they do not subscribe to evolutionary theory uh, beliefs. So he says this, it could be that at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means, and he has to insert this, by some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this planet. This seeding of the planet is called panspermia, and I won't have time to talk to you about abiogenesis or origins of life because there is simply no standing theory accepted in the scientific world that would even come close to proposing as to how the life went from non-organic to organic matter as well. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the details of biochemistry, molecular biology. You might find a signature of some sort of designer, but not designer because on this earth because it must have been through a naturalistic process all by itself, all unguided, all uncontrolled. Again, if the world looks so designed, could it be that it was designed? This is my simple challenge to my friends who don't believe and perhaps uh, something for you to think as well. Uh, first, first field I want to really talk to you about is the universe. There is a bigger proportion of scientists who are astronomers who believe in God or who believe in supernatural uh, being than in any other field. Why? Because they are well aware of how, what would it take for the laws to hold the universe and to put it into existence. So this is, I will even skip talking about the beginning of the universe where people, when they discovered the Big Bang, discovered, wow, the universe had a beginning and therefore it had a beginning and therefore 
where he come from, where it all came from. But I want to just talk to you about fine tuning. Fine tuning is one of those things that Darwin never heard about. And the scientists today are really confused with. So what is time fine tuning? Uh, George Greenstein said this about uh, fine tuning. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon the scientific proof of the existence of supreme being? Imagine yourself walking through a dense jungle for three days, stumbling on a house, and you walk in the house, and everything inside the house is exactly made to your liking, to your measure, to your specifications for health, for health reasons. I don't know if you, like me, take anything for, um, for your health. I'm taking uh, cholesterol tablets. So you walk into, your, in the, into this house, and they are exactly your medicine. Clothes fit you perfectly and they are exactly what you like. The bookshelves have only your favorite authors. The mattress in the bedroom is perfect, uh, perfect, perfect uh, for you, and, the, and, and the, the pillow is the right thickness, and the food in the fridge is exactly what you like. There is nothing in this house that is random, that looks like there is nothing from you. The pictures over there are of your family and of your favorite authors. After a while, you stop believing that this is just coincidence. You start believing that someone expected your arrival. And this is just a very weak parallel to what actually fine tuning is. I'm gonna show you a quick video. And I'm showing you how actually fine-tuned our universe is. This will be neat sound as well, guys. Thank you. From galaxies and stars down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. So the universe seemed like it was expecting life that we know it. What's the non-believers uh, answer to this? Well, there are many of them. And anything I said here on the theory of science will be, of course, countered back by different reasons. But uh, what the best idea that, that was come up with the multiverse. So the universe looked so fine-tuned, so well-designed by God, that somebody said, you know what, we can't have, have God. It looks like Mr. Bean, but it must not be Mr. Bean. Uh, it must be something else. So here is our theory. Our universe, which is so fine-tuned, so well-designed, is just one of billions of other universes. Somebody said, yeah, yeah, there must be a machine somewhere that produces all these billions of multiverses, all the different settings. And we just happen to be in one universe that has this type of settings and therefore it's um, anthropomorphic or the, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's inviting life to thrive and to happen and to live. 
Is multiverse really a scientific answer to the fine tuning? Well, I don't believe so. There is no, no one shred of real empirical evidence. It's just an excuse not to believe in the God who created it. So there are three, basically, ways you can go about this argument. One is saying that fine-tuning of the universe is merely a coincidence, and then you imagine yourself again in that house that has all your stuff, from glass prescriptions, you know, thickness, and so everything else, and ask yourself, am I so naive to believe that this is a real coincidence? Or number two, you have to have a scapegoat and say, well, multiverse. Or number three, could it just be that a person that looks like Mr. Bean is Mr. Bean. That it, if there it looks like design, in fact, this is designed by a designer. Sir Fred Hoyle, who is in no way a Christian or a believer or theist, says this. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to be so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. I love studying this topic, and in the next minute, I'm just gonna give you an overview of what I was going to go through you, and I would love to talk to you, perhaps on one Wednesday evening, when we can talk about science and the faith. But from here, we can go into molecular biology and explore uh, Charles Darwin's famous uh, saying that, uh, that um, evolutionary theory depends on numerous successive slight modifications, slight modifications of what already exists to be able to add the information. And then we can talk about some other uh, really, really complex organisms uh, like the eye or the cell, or talk even about DNA that is not just governed by the laws of physics, but it has semantic value, which means it has a language that it knows, it then uh, transfers it to somebody else that no, understands this language, and this language has to have a meaning. Uh, I can talk to you in any number of gibberish, and I can say to you like which means absolutely nothing. And what did you gain? Just a noise. But when I speak to you, you are receiving the meaning and behind my pronounced words is hidden meaning. This is what DNA is. And when you study DNA, then you find Paul Davis who says something like this, uh, the problem of how meaningful or semantic information can emerge spontaneously from a collection of mindless, mindless molecules subjects to blind and purposeless forces presents a deep conceptual challenge. You cannot develop this over long time, over slow incremental development. There is no purpose for it. There is number one reason, no reason why a language would develop within our body or from, from nothing, from the non-organic matter. And the second, how could this develop as well? I could talk to you about abiogenesis and simply impossible uh, way of life cre being created here. Uh, and about the ridiculous uh, thing of uh, just thinking about panspermia of a way of bringing life here, which is just basically a relegating problem of life to somewhere else where again, this life would need to be um, explained. But self-replication is something that I've studied recently and it becomes very, very amazing when you study it. Charles Darwin said that in order for life to come, you have to have some mechanisms. You have to have mutation, natural selection. There are four, two other smaller things that he's uh, putting there as well. But all of this depends on one thing, and this is reproduction. Natural selection doesn't have to, can't select from anything that doesn't exist. Can only select from things already existing. Mutations have to happen when one organism is reproduced into another. And I think guitar string just went off. Somebody killed the guitar. And so if you don't have a reproduction, you don't have mutations. You don't have natural selection. And question really is, how did self-reproduction come to evolve 
if the very mechanism of evolution, self-reproduction, is missing? Or, to complicate it, how do you develop a necessary part for developing necessary parts? And this is a real question that scientists are baffled with. Joe Haldane says this, origin of life theories do not provide a sufficient explanation of self-reproduction since they presuppose the existence at an early stage of self-reproduction. And it has not been shown that this can arise by natural means from a material base. John Haldane is a... Uh, um, I don't think he's a believer as well. He's a scientist there. And he goes on to saying that this thing, we, we have to stop assuming and presupposing. We presuppose life, we presuppose a reproduction, and then we start building from this a theory that has no way of explaining how did this start with in the beginning. All of this, to me, shows that there is a designer who creates a wonderful, complex world, and then let us explore it through science. I'm going to skip through many photos now and go to... Can you just lift my computer smaller? Paleontology. Paleontology is a studying of the old things or a studying of the fossils. Uh, Charles Darwin believed that uh, when you... I want to explain the evolution of life, you would talk about, again, these small gradual, uh, gradual changes, mutations, and you would find in the fossils evidence of theoretical knowledge. You would find the transitional forms from one type of kind of animals into another kind of animals. Now, as Christians, we believe in evolution. Of course we do. We believe in microevolution. Microevolution is simply observing the changes that mutation and natural selections do, which we believe in as well, and we observe how do they change themselves. Microevolution is responsible for why we have to get a different uh, shoots for immunization every, every year, because uh, microbes and viruses uh, mutate, and there are always new ones, that are resistant and to, our, uh, to our medicine. And so all of these mutations of viruses, of microbes, of dogs, of cats, of everything, happens within, this, within a kind. The Bible de defines them as a kind of animals. A microbe has never become anything else but microbe. Virus has never mutated into anything else but another type of virus. And we work with this, and the scientists are very happy to believe in this because this is a true science. It's testable, it's observable. But then Darwin made a big jump from microevolution to macroevolution, believing that from these very, very simple cells, uh, through transitional forms, you can develop something much more complex like man. And then he said one question why can't we find any of those transitional forms in the fossils. Uh, you would have to find millions of those if this is true. But he said, but as this theory, by, as by this theory, innumerable transitional forms must have existed, why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth? What do we find in fossils? Are exact animals like today existing one, or the ex, um, extinct animals. But we do not find the transitional forms. By Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, we should find millions and millions of them. In fact, we should not even find something completely strong. Uh, and this is, of course, a problem, a huge problem, that leads us again to say, this points towards a designer, a designer that starts with complex and let it develop into some other variations as well. Niles Eldridge said, no one has found any such in-between creatures and there is growing conviction among many scientists that these transitional forms never existed. 
I would like to point out one website for you. This is yorigins.com, y-origins.com. Uh, this is where lots of materials from my sermon come from and I'm giving credit to. Please go there today if you have uh, interest in this field to learn more and then uh, really grow in this knowledge. This is my conclusion and from this website, I like it, how they put it together. Thus, when scientists take issue with Darwin's theory of evolution, they are not debating changes evident within a species. Of course this is scientific, of course this is observable, this is normal. They are simply pointing out the fact that no evidence exists that all of life evolved by undirected natural selection. Uh, Bible says in Acts chapter 17, I believe, or 27, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of he heaven and earth. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men. Here is the stop of racism. One man, from one, all other Bible translation says, from one blood he created all other people. All of us come from one family. All of us come from one designer. And therefore we are not competing against each other. Therefore in Christian worldview, we need to support each other and be there for each other. We are the ones who should be preaching tolerance and love and acceptance, pointing them towards this God. And then say this, God did this so that man would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from many in each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Let me pray. The Heavenly Father, I open a can of worms. I just touched barely the evidence of your design in, in, in the creation which you have made. Help us be scientists in this church. Help us be persons who love to study and know and see how, like Isaac Newton said, how you created all of this, this beauty around us. Help us use this in science to praise you and give you glory for your love for life and joy and different tastes and spices and animals and all other looks is so amazing. Today we want to give you praise for all of this and we want to give you praise for our world which we are expecting, world, world which you have ensured for us through your sacrifice on the cross. Today we want to accept you and invite you into our lives and ask you, the originator, creator, and designer of ourselves, to be our Lord of our lives too. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.